So good morning. It is so great to be with you. I love studying God's word. Disclaimer, I am not a theologian. And there are parts of the Bible that are really hard to understand. And even theologians don't always agree on some of those things. So I have chosen not to really dissect some of those more deeper, harder, more complex things. It will not change what I believe God is trying to teach us today, I promise you. The other thing I did, you may have noticed on the slide, is I changed the title of chapter 10, and I hope that's okay with you. It originally said, faith gets difficult. I changed it to, when faith gets difficult, look beneath the surface. So let's look at these slides for a minute. This could be maybe, whoop, let's go back one. Maybe that could be some granite, some slabs of granite. Let's go to the next one. Ooh, maybe that's a picture of the moon up close or a planet. Let's look at the next one. Maybe underwater scape of some kind. Maybe a rainforest. What about the last one? Maybe a honeycomb of some type? Keep those in mind. As an educator for over 30 years, I have worked with children as young as two, and now I teach at a college, so I work with kids that are a little bit older now. But I never tire of that aha moment. I never tire of guiding a student to see something in a different light. So bringing a student to discover a reality that has always been there, but they just couldn't quite see. It's really, really thrilling. I love how the author opened up this chapter. She talked about the science teacher who places a speck of dirt under the microscope and suddenly opens up a whole new world to her students. The author says it this way, everything now has potential to be more than it seems. Just like the slides that we just saw, which were actually of skin cells, it's still the reality. It's just that we couldn't perceive it with our naked eye. We needed to get up close and kind of underneath it. In many ways, chapter 9 of Mark is exactly like this. Mark takes what seems ordinary, just like our skin, our flesh, we see it every single day of our lives, and yet he moves us into deeper space. He reveals deeper meaning. But we can only see it if we are willing to look beneath the surface. Um, would you pray with me before we get started? Dear Lord, I just love you. I love that you call us to get up close and personal with you. It is there that your glory is revealed to us. I pray that we would be willing to look beneath the surface, to be challenged, to be thrilled by what we are going to discover today. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so we start off our lesson with Jesus doing some mountain climbing. He took three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, why he picked those three, I don't know. Some theologian might know. I didn't take time to really dive into that, but he took three. Maybe they were more prominent, not any better, just more prominent than the other disciples. And we do know that six days prior to this mountain hike, Jesus predicts his death, and Peter makes a confession. Let's just peek back at Mark 8.31. It reads, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. There are four very important facts that were stated here. First of all, the Son of Man will suffer many things. Second, he'll be rejected. Third, he'll be killed. And fourth, after three days, he'll rise again. 
Verse 32 tells us that Jesus spoke these things plainly. He didn't hide what was going to happen. He spoke it out. And it reminds me of what I do as a college professor. I have learned to talk very plainly and simply to my college students. For instance, when I know that something is going to be on an exam, I say something very plainly and clearly, and it sounds like this. Okay, this section of your textbook, this part right here, right here on page 38, paragraph three, sentence two, this part will be on the exam. <laughs> like there's absolutely nothing hidden. This is a reality, students. This will be on the exam. I will often repeat this statement leading up to the exam. My students may not like the reality that I'm going to give them an exam, but the reality remains that there will be an exam and they better be prepared for it. They may argue that they don't want or need an exam, but the reality is there's going to be an exam. The fact that Jesus will have to suffer and die is a reality that Peter did not like. Just because he didn't like it, it didn't change the fact that the reality was Jesus was going to suffer and die. And, Je and Peter actually rebukes Jesus. And Jesus basically says to Peter, you are looking with your human eyes. I need you to get out that microscope. I need you to look beneath the surface of what your naked eye can see. And I need you to encounter realities that coexist with what your naked eye can see and what is beneath the surface. Peter, look with your spiritual eyes. And I believe that that's what God is telling us to do this morning. So Jesus predicting his death is not a new reality. Jesus' death and resurrection was prophesied throughout the Old Testament, mentioned in the New Testament. A few chapters before in Mark 2, Jesus said that the bridegroom, Jesus, would be taken from them. He has been preparing his disciples all along for this exam. He is reminding them to be prepared and study hard. The coursework is getting more difficult now for them. The reality of Jesus having to suffer and die will come closer into view as Jesus' disciples look beneath the surface. They will begin to look with spiritual eyes, and as they do, they will encounter God's glory. And as we do that, we too will encounter God's glory. Okay, let's get back on that hiking trip. It had been about six days since Peter made his confession, saying, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now Jesus, Peter, James, and John got on their hiking sandals. Have you ever hiked a mountain, by the way? You need, like, really strong boots. I'm wondering what they were wearing. They, you know, have you ever thought about that? They're hiking in sandals up. And what do we know about this mountain? We may not know the exact name of the mountain. Even theologians kind of disagree. But scripture tells us it was a high mountain. So we know that it must have been difficult to walk up that mountain. And we also know that it was there on that mountain that Jesus is transfigured. And his clothes become dazzling white, whiter than any bleach could have done. I love that. As a mom, I had four young kids, and it's like I should have taken out stock and Clorox. I would have been a gazillionaire. But let's pause for a minute and look beneath the word transfiguration. One commentary says that it is a revelation in part of God's glory, of what will be fully realized. So it's a reality in part of what exists already, but we're just getting a glimpse of it. Remember that um, the chapter before, God was telling his disciples some hard things. He was going to have to suffer and die. So one commentary said that this transfiguration was also for the disciples' benefit, to encourage them, to bring them up close into the reality that exists, and to comfort them. Um, 
So let's get back to the scene. The guys make it up to the mountain. Now, I don't know about you, but if I just walk around the block, I'm exhausted and I need to rehydrate. So they have physically taken a toll on their body, but emotionally, remember, they were following Jesus around, engaging in ministry, participating in healings, participating in teachings. So they were probably emotionally tired. Did they need time just to kind of take in the view from the mountaintop? I would have. They get to the top, and right before them, we know in verse 2, it says that Jesus, Peter, James, and John were alone, and Jesus is transformed before them. Now, it's really easy just to skim right through that. We've heard that before, the transfiguration. But let's get out the microscope. Let's look beneath the surface. If we look at Luke's account, we gain a bit more details. I'd like to read his account from Luke 9, 28 to 32. About eight days after, okay, Mark said six days. That's one of those details that we're not going to get hung up on. Jesus said, Jesus took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he, Jesus, was praying, the appearance of his face and his clothes changed. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about Jesus' departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. All right, let's look beneath the surface here. What do we learn? We learn that in verse 28, the men went up to a mountain. They went up to pray, but it looks like only Jesus prayed, if we look at the Luke account. And as Jesus was praying, he was transformed. Two men appear, Moses and Elijah, in glorious splendor. And I don't know about you, but I wondered how Peter knew their names. He had never met them. I don't think he saw a picture of them, but yet he somehow knew their names. And Jesus speaks about his departure. We learned that Peter, James, and John were sleepy, but then they became fully awake. So let's note some things. Jesus prayed and his appearance changed. This is a beautiful reality and a beautiful depiction of what happens when we encounter God. We, too, begin to reflect his glory to those around us. We know that nothing about Jesus' circumstances had changed by praying. He was still going to have to suffer and die. Yet he had a glow about him, and the glory about him could not be denied in spite of the reality that he was going to suffer and die. When we encounter God, we leave his presence transformed. The word transfigure comes from the Greek word metamorpho, which means metamorphosis, which means to change, make new, or elevate, just like a caterpillar to a butterfly. When we pray before a holy God, we leave more beautiful, more elevated, more transformed. This is a reality that Peter, James, and John witnessed. We also learn that the two men appeared, and as an aside note, these are the same two men who seem to have like disappeared, like they can't find Moses' body where it was buried, and then Elijah was caught up in a whirlwind, and now these two guys suddenly reappear. I just think that's interesting. It's like a um, soap opera where like the characters never really die. They go away, and then they like come back like years later, and they were like found at sea or something. Um, but we do know that it could not have been a hallucination because Luke tells us that the disciples were fully awake. They were fully present for this reality. 
All right, let's hop back into Mark 9, verse 5. You've got to love Peter. I love him. I'm a lot like him. When I get nervous, I start to babble, kind of similar to what I'm doing now. But I start to babble, and I say things without really thinking through it. Peter does that here. He says, Rabbi, which is teacher. It is so good that we are, like, all here with you right now. Let me go make some shelters for you and this guy and this other guy. Like, I'm scared. I'm like a nervous wreck, but this is so cool. And I just have to do something because I have all this nervous energy. So I'm going to go, like, build some tents for you guys. Of course, I paraphrased that a little bit. But I really, really love what Peter is feeling in this moment. Peter wants to linger on the mountaintop. Have you ever experienced the mountaintop where you are brought so close into the presence of God that you're scared, it's, it's exhilarating, and you don't understand it, and you just know you don't want to leave that mountaintop experience. You're feeling so close to the glory of God. I think that's how Peter must have been feeling, and he's like, I'm just not ready to leave this mountaintop experience. Then, all of a sudden, the cloud envelops the two guys, and we hear a voice, which was sort of normal. That was kind of God's presence. And this voice says, this voice of God says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. It's kind of reminded of me of when I was raising my four kids. I'd be in the other room, like, yelling at them, like, listen to me, I'm your mother. And they wouldn't, and then all of a sudden my husband from the other room would boom out his big, deep voice, kind of like your husband's. And he would say, kids, listen to your mother. And it was like my husband was validating my authority. Maybe this was happening here. Maybe God was validating the reality that even though Jesus did not look like a king, even though he would not be recognized as the Messiah. The reality is, he was all that. He is the Messiah. And this word, listen, this phrase, listen to him, that God said is really obey. Obey what this Christ, this Messiah says. So after that, cloud talking, the disciples look around and Moses and Elijah are gone. And that's happened before. Those guys seem to come and go. These two have done this disappearing act before. Anyhow, the men decide to make the trek back down the mountain. As the four are walking down the mountain, I cannot help but wonder what the conversation sounded like. I love to think about those things. Like, scripture doesn't really give us a lot of those details. I'm 100% Italian, so if I wrote the Bible, it would be like, like you'd have to push it in a wheelbarrow because I don't leave out details. I love the details. And so I like to imagine what was going on. Maybe Peter was saying, Jesus, that was like the coolest thing we've seen yet. That was so cool. Like your whole face was shining and your clothes were glowing. That was so cool. How did you do it? James and John may have chimed in and said something like, Jesus, did you know Moses and Elijah were going to be there too? How did they get there? Jesus then cuts into the conversation and says in verse 9, and I'm paraphrasing, hey guys, this whole situation that just went down, let's not tell anybody about it. Let's just keep it between between us, okay? It was kind of a weird thing for Jesus to say, but he had said that once before, back in chapter 8, after Peter made his confession. Okay, let's just keep this between the four of us. The disciples did keep the matter to themselves, but they kept on discussing the matter of the rising, raising from the dead, because in Jewish belief, they thought everybody would be raised together, that the resurrection would not happen one person at a time. So 
again, those are details that aren't going to change what God is trying to teach us here. They soon left the topic and asked Jesus why the teachers of the law said that Elijah must come first. That was in verse 11. Are you confused by that part? Are you? Let's be honest. Like we're all women. And we don't I don't have a you know a seminary degree. That's confusing. And even when you look at the commentary, it's somewhat confusing. But if we look beneath the surface and we see what's there, it's simple. We see that only Jesus Christ could declare it is finished. Elijah and Moses and John the Baptist prepared the way, but they didn't have the power to finish the work. Only Jesus could declare it is finished. When our human eyes alone cannot perceive all of these realities that are happening in the spaces and places beneath the surface, we can only rely on faith. We can only say, God, I don't fully understand this. Help me understand this. And by faith, we grow to trust God. And our unbelief is changed to belief somehow when we look with spiritual eyes at the reality of God's infinite glory. So profound that like the theologians in the commentaries I was reading, They can't always fully articulate it. But by faith, we believe it. And when we struggle, we ask God, help my unbelief. Okay, back to the disciples walking down the mountain. Do you think they were tired? I do. They had just witnessed something so unbelievable, so otherworldly, yet a reality. And now a different reality awaits them, right? They had that mountaintop experience like we've all had. It's like when you're a young mom and you have lots of kids and you go away for a night alone and then you come back and you're like all excited. You're driving home. You're like, I'm a new woman. And then you open the front door and everything's chaotic and the house is a mess and you're just like, okay, there's reality. It's not that that other reality didn't exist. You did go away for a night and have a fabulous time, but now this reality exists too. So we have two realities kind of God's glory, being in his presence, and now the reality of ministry, which is about to get very, very hard. So as they walk down to the bottom of the mountain, they see a large crowd, and they also see the disciples and the teachers of the law arguing. I love this verse. While the disciples and the teachers of the law are arguing, the crowd perceives Jesus. And if you're just skimming over verses and not looking underneath, you may have missed that. So the crowd rushes over to Jesus, overwhelmed by wonder. Are you overwhelmed by wonder in the presence of God? There he was. And there are some of the disciples and the teachers of the law arguing these points of the Bible that may not really matter right now. And there's the chosen one. There's Jesus. Do you stand overwhelmed and in wonder when you encounter Jesus? So finally, this arguing is going on and a voice cuts through the chaos. Teacher, someone from the crowd yells out, I brought my son to you. He's got a spirit that stops him from speaking, and whenever it takes hold of him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth, and he gets stiff. I spoke to your disciples about casting it out, but they could not. Oh, no. This does not make Jesus very happy. And Jesus replies, You unbelieving generation of people, how much longer must I be with you? Like, like, please, people, look underneath the surface. Look beneath the surface. See with your spiritual eyes what I have been teaching you. How much longer must I put up with you? Bring me that boy. 
Why is Jesus disappointed? Again, it's easy just to skim over that, but let's look beneath the surface. Was it that the disciples lacked faith? No, we will learn that soon, that we all lack faith from time to time. But it was, what, it was that the disciples did not perceive that lack of faith. See, it's not wrong that we lack faith, but what sometimes trips us up is we don't want to either admit it because it would look like a bad Christian if we lack faith. So Jesus wants the disciples to just be honest. We all lack faith from time to time. Now more than ever, Jesus knows he must finish the work that he came to do. Jesus asked the man to bring him the boy. In verse 20, we know that as soon as the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. Now, I don't know about you, but I had a son years ago when he was about eight break his arm, and it was dangling off. And I scooped him up, put him in the car, ran to the emergency room, and I was like, you know, I didn't even go through kiosks. I was crying crying on behalf of my son and it was like fix my son he's in so much pain it like it grieved me as his mom and this dad had been putting up with this for so long think about the crowds think about the chaos here's this boy rolling around foaming at the mouth and as a mom when my kid threw a tantrum in public it was so embarrassing but here's this dad with this son who's uncontrollable. Maybe the crowds were pointing fingers at the dad saying, what did you do that he's like this? Or why can't you control your son? I'm sure it wasn't a calm scene. And this dad was desperate. This dad was desperate. Have you ever been desperate? Have you ever doubted the reality of God? In desperation, this dad yells out, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Just picture the scene, the boy rolling around, a desperate dad, a growing crowd, if you can do anything. And I love Jesus' response. He puts the question back on the dad. If you can, everything is possible for him who believes. Look underneath that. Look beneath the surface. Everything is possible for me. Everything is possible for you if you believe. Jesus didn't lord any power over this man. He didn't make him feel stupid, which is something I like to do with my kids when they were little. I'd be like, I told you so. If you do that, oh, I told you so. He doesn't do any of that. Instead, he gives an invitation to this man and to all those listening, and he says, everything is possible for him who believes. He's inviting this man into a reality. We are told that the dad yelled out a guttural, painful cry of desperation. Have you been there? Have you been so desperate for healing for yourself or a loved one? Have you been so desperate for your marriage to be made whole? Have you been so riddled with disease and illness that you just cry out of desperation? Have you lost some of your faith? That's normal. Jesus knows that. This dad yells out, I do believe there's a reality. Help me overcome my unbelief. There's a reality. Neither is more of a reality and as women, we walk that line all the time between believing and needing help in our unbelief. And that is beautiful. And the Father's response is so real, so human. 
You know, and I believe that that day that boy was healed and that dad was healed, right? And that's a beautiful thing. Jesus does heal that boy and that spirit leaves the boy and the boy looks like he's dead and Jesus picks him up. And the last portion of this lesson is so easy to overlook because when the disciples get alone with Jesus, do you remember what they asked Jesus? I love this because Jesus didn't point the finger and say, if you had done this, you could have healed that boy. Jesus waits for the disciples to ask Jesus the question, why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we do what you did? Jesus basically says, look, you guys, you've been hanging out with me for three years now. I keep saying the same thing over and over and over again, you know, and you're still not getting it. Listen, your faith is still weak. And there's a time coming where you're just going to have to step it up. Ministry is about to get real. You have been following me. I have been leading. I have been telling you, go collect the bits of fish and bread. I have been telling you what's underneath the parables. Okay? Now you need to encounter God. You need to pray. You know, our biggest problems are only solved through prayer when we get into the presence of God. And like we saw with Jesus, his condition didn't change. He still has to suffer and die. But he experiences the glory of God, which is so transformational that we can look at our situations and walk through them with a level of certainty and peace. I believe that God is saying to us today, women, friends, aunts, moms, grandmas, daughters, sisters, whatever your role is, I believe that God is saying to us, stay awake, pray, pray deeper, pray more often, keep the faith, let me help you with your unbelief. I believe that it's time for us as women to be prepared for what God is going to do with us as we enter new ministries and new seasons in our lives. And um, I believe that God wants to meet us in our day-to-day -day realities, but he also wants to pull us in close, put that microscope up to our eyes, and let us see his glory face-to-face -face and see it new. Can I just pray for you all before we end? Lord, I thank you that the reality is that we have faith, but sometimes we need help with our unbelief. It's a reality, and I pray that as women, we would be willing to get real with you, that we would be willing to be vulnerable with you, to sit in your presence and experience your glory. And Lord, we experience that glory so that those around us can see you in us, that we can minister to those around us with confidence. Lord, I thank you for these women. I ask that you bless them. We love you, Jesus. Amen.